I've gone to a few of the recent biohacking conferences and they're really into um, high fat, you know, the keto diet and everything out there now is keto. As far as they say that you can only achieve satiety if you do this high fat keto diet. And I do have a problem. I am highly plant-based with satiety. Then later I'm craving something, you know, after I eat all my super healthy food. So um, can you address the keto high fat and then also satiety without the high fat? Thank you. Yeah. So it is true that eating uh, in the, in the originally they talked about high protein, high fat diets. That's pretty much been acknowledged as, as being a health compromising habit. So then they tried to improve it by going on a plant-based high fat low protein diet. The idea is to mimic fasting's effect of hunger blunting. One of the problems that people have is because they're used to eating refined carbohydrates um, is that their blood insulin levels are not stable. So they eat sugar, the blood insulin goes up, it drives the sugar down, the brain thinks you're starving, you get cravings and binging and this goes on and on. And it's very difficult to uh, reach satiety. When people do fasting, of course, they they, they uh, stabilize their blood sugar, blood insulin levels, which is why, you know, 80% of our type two diabetics will achieve normal blood sugar without medication. And it happens in people that are not diabetic as well. They get much more stable. That can also happen over time with a whole plant food diet, particularly if you're willing to do really radical things like exercise and get enough sleep, manage your stress and other issues. And so um, it's true that the short-term effect of a high fat diet may lead to better satiety control, but the longer term effect of a whole plant food SOS free diet yields the same kind of satiety control, but without compromising your health long-term. So our goal is not only to live a long life, but to avoid the debility that most people suffer from. Eating high fat, high protein diets doesn't allow that to happen. In fact, it leads to other problems. People end up with all kinds of gallbladder problems and digestive issues and ultimately increased risk for heart disease uh, as well. So I, again, I'm thinking long-term, not short-term, long-term whole plant food, SOS-free diet, 10% of calories from protein, 15 to 18% of calories uh, from fat, and the balance from complex carbohydrates, not refined carbohydrates, uh, along with moderate exercise, appropriate rest, uh, people are able to achieve and maintain normal weight control with this. If you're a male, you can expect about three pounds a week of weight loss, uh, if you're a female, just two. Uh, women are going to lose on average about 50% less than a male, everything else being equal, because they have lots of estrogen, which is a fat storage hormone, whereas men tend to have higher testosterone levels, which is a fat burning hormone. So if you're a male, it's going to be a little bit easier. doesn't mean you can't be fat, but you're going to have to work harder at it than your female uh, counterpart. It's going to be, in fact, you know, women say they don't even have to like, if they just walk by the buffet table, they gain a pound or have a bad dream and they go up a dress size. And it does feel like that because women are biologically designed as energy conserving fat storage devices, females of all species, because they have to survive a period of vulnerability called pregnancy. So their ability to be able to store fat was a biological advantage. And in a natural setting, it would be because you'd get enough to eat and live to reproduce. Your ancestors, if you're a female, were the ones that got enough to eat and didn't get eaten. And they were, so they were the, the ones that could efficiently store fat because they evolved in an environment of scarcity, not this environment of abundance that we live in today. Today, if you have those, what would have been an advantage in a natural setting is a disadvantage today because you have to work twice as hard for half the results in order to be able to achieve and maintain optimum weight. You just can't get away with anything. And that's why I tell people, you know, if, if you really want to know, should you eat something or not, just look at the substance and close your eyes and go inside yourself. And ask yourself honestly, do I really, 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 really want whatever it is? And if the answer is truly yes, you know. You can't have it. You get nothing. Because if you really, really, really want it, you want it that badly because it's activating the pleasure trap and you're dealing with some of the drug-like effects from the dietary choices you have. It doesn't mean you're not going to like your food. It doesn't mean you're not going to like to eat. But it's, it's, it's like the difference between loud rock and roll music and uh, classical music. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy music, having classical music, but it's not gonna have the same overwhelming impact on the nervous system short term. But you do adapt to it, you get to the point where ultimately you'd actually prefer it. Now I have to stop eating my Van Halen, thanks. Um, 
thank you very much for that, Dr. Goldhammer. And uh, let's go now to Andrew. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Goldhammer. Love your work. Um, as far as Crohn's disease goes with water fasting, I, I think you've written some or had some experience with some remission. How long of a water fast have you seen remission with Crohn's disease and how long has that remission lasted? And a follow-up to that is, can water fasting address uh, fistulas, the symptoms uh, non-surgically from Crohn's disease? Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, we treat lots of patients with uh, Crohn's and colitis and, and, and other conditions involving uh, chronic inflammation in the digestive system. Again, these are autoimmune diseases where it's the body's immune system that's attacking itself. And what we believe contributes, uh, besides the genetic predisposition, you know, and uh, higher tendency for some people to be vulnerable to this, is the alteration of the gut microbiome. Um, we know that there should be a thousand strain or more of different organisms living in the intestinal tract. And what they, these are living creatures, you know, five pounds of living creatures that are, that are living and eating and drinking and defecating inside you. And what your organisms poo inside you, inside your intestinal tract could be TMA and other toxic agents, or it could be fertilizer like vitamin K and nutrients you need. And what determines what your organisms poo in you, it depends on what you feed them. So if you feed them a diverse plant-based diet, you're going to have a completely different microbiome than the people that are eating meat, fish, fowl, eggs, and dairy products. In fact, we've done the first study on long-term water fasting's effect on the microbiome. We did it with Luigi Fontana from Washington University. Those results will be coming out later this year. So, and what we, uh, what we believe we're going to be able to demonstrate is that that diversity uh, uh, post-fasting with a whole plant food diet is a way of kind of rebooting the microbiome, it's like rebooting the hard drive in a computer that becomes corrupted. You don't know why, but the thing's not working, it's freezing. If you shut it down, you turn it back on, and for whatever reason, now it starts to work again. Well, we believe that there's an analogy to fasting and doing a similar kind of functional correction. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to prove that um, shortly. As far as Crohn's disease, uh, ulcerative colitis, all the various manifestations of inflammatory bowel diseases, Fasting can be an effective way of shutting down everything. And then you reboot with a carefully controlled diet to meet that individual's needs so that the inflammatory process can heal and the gut leakage can heal. When you have intestinal mucosa with a fine membrane with tiny little holes that don't let things like bacteria or protein molecules through. But if that intestinal mucosa becomes inflamed from exposure, for example, to free radicals, then things can leak through. Free radicals could be coming from smoking, peroxidation of alcohol, drinking alcohol, eating uh, high fat, high protein foods, particularly cooked at high temperatures. These rich sources of free radicals can lead to inflammation. Inflammation leads to gut leakage. Gut leakage stimulates uh, the immune system to react to those proteins. And all, in vulnerable people, the immune system will attack its own tissues. If it attacks the intestinal tract, we call it Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or one of those conditions. If it attacks the uh, Kidneys, you might be calling it lupus, or the skin is vasculitis, or the lungs might be asthma, the, uh, we see psoriasis, we see all kinds of uh, conditions. Um, in fact, we have a paper coming out on plaque psoriasis that's really quite dramatic, uh, where again, the immune system is attacking the skin, and it responds uh, dramatically to fasting and, and this dietary approach. Now, you asked about how long will the results sustain? Much like the treatment of obesity, you can't cure obesity. You can lose the weight and keep it off, but you have to keep eating well. Uh, with, with Crohn's, you can't cure Crohn's, but you can get its symptoms under control and keep them under control. But you have to be willing to continue to eat properly. You have to continue to get enough sleep and dissipate stress with exercise. So you have to live healthfully in order to sustain the results because this is not a cure, it's a management strategy. Thank you very much for that, doctor. And um, let's go now to oh, James. Welcome, James. Thank you very much, doctor. You're a, tra a national treasure. Uh, I have um, seven years remission from lymphoma, and I've gone whole food plant-based three and a half years ago and also gluten-free. Any other suggestions? I know you guys have had some great results at your uh, true north. Well, we're very excited about uh, yeah, the effect of fasting on lymphoma. Our first published case paper was uh, six years ago. We had a 42-year-old woman with stage three follicular lymphoma that came in and despite 
um, less than uh, enthusiastic support from her oncologist, she underwent 21 days of water fasting during which time her tumors disappeared. And we followed her uh, for three years with follow-up CTs, et cetera, and we were able to show that her lymphoma resolved. And now we have a uh, six-year follow-up with whole body CT showing that she's maintained cancer-free. And, and, and we've published those in the British Medical Journal's case reports, uh, which is really, uh, was really good. It's a big impact journal. Um, and then since then, and since the publication of those cases, we've been treating a significant number of patients with lymphoma, including stage four lymphoma with infiltration into the marrow. We've just recently had some very exciting results. One uh, gentleman actually, uh, you could see uh, or feel improvement, went back to his oncologist at three months who wouldn't actually do the CT that we wanted at that point because he said the person had obviously improved so dramatically there was no justification. We wanted to wait till six months. So we're waiting for the six month follow-up. Now we're optimistic that we'll see great results there. We have another one uh, also that we did fasting with uh, that uh, has had excellent results. Both of these were 40 day water fasts. So the person came in and fasted on water only for 40 days during which time uh, these conditions uh, came under control. And what's exciting is we're now showing three or six year and longer follow-ups. So not only can people bring the condition under control, but they're able to sustain the control. But again, this is with a whole plant food, SOS-free diet, sleep and exercise. Um, so what we're hoping to do is publish this cohort later in the year. And then we wanna do a clinical trial where we'll get, um, for example, 60 subjects with lymphoma divided randomly by assignment, half will undergo fasting and dietary care, half will get conventional care, and we'll compare long-term to see um, which group does uh, dramatically better. Uh, and so we're, we are excited because uh, so far the results that we've seen have been very gratifying. And for those willing to do really dangerous and radical things like eat well, uh, it looks like they're able to sustain those results as well. Radical indeed. Thank you very much, doctor. And uh, well, you know, radical means uh, if you go back to the original uh, word, it means from root or cause. And so we are radical because we're trying to deal with the root or cause, which are the diet and lifestyle factors that make people uh, sick. Got it. Got it. Thank you for that. And um, so now we'll bring in uh, David R. Welcome, David. Hello, doctor. Um, I'm a vegan. I try to minimize my SOS. And uh, I did the omega, omega score testing lately and find that I have a severe deficiency in omega. Uh, I got a score of one, which I recommended is to be above five. Although I eat daily uh, four tablespoons ground uh, flaxseed and lots of walnuts and lots of other uh, uh, nuts and seeds that have uh, that have omega. So my question for you is: uh, Would you how how would you recommend to handle such a situation? Would you recommend to do although you are not recommending oil to take plant-based oil like uh, like flaxseed oil and some other uh, that uh, press gold? Or how would you recommend to deal with omega three deficiency? Although a, or a person or a patient take uh, take uh, flat uh, seeds and nuts uh, on a daily basis, but still you have uh, such a low score. Yeah. So I wouldn't recommend the use of oils at all. Uh, you can certainly make sure the, cons the consumption of whole foods, you know, your brown, brown flax seeds uh, or hemp seeds, your walnuts are appropriate and sufficient. In the worst case scenario, for some reason, your absorption capacity or conversion capacity to make decosoxonic acid or other uh, essential fatty acids is limited. You can use vegan supplementation of those substances. They do have, I think Mertec has a process where they use uh, algae and are able to uh, you know, form DHA uh, so that your body wouldn't be limited in terms of converting. Uh, omega-3 across. So I would say consult a plant-based uh, nutrition person. If you're interested in a doctor that's uh, familiar with this, you can go to our website, healthpromoting.com. We have a telemedicine practice with a dozen clinicians um, that can help you fine tune, you know, your particular individual situation. So there's an affordable way of getting access to a doctor that's not an idiot, that's, you know, experienced with people actually getting well 
And all you have to do is you go to our website, healthpony.com, you complete the registration forms, which gets us your medical history. We offer a no cost phone conversation to match you with the best doctor for your situation. And then you can uh, consult with the doctor of your choice through Zoom or through uh, the phone. So it's a, it's a nice service, it's available to people all over the world. So that works out well. Thanks, Dr. Goldhammer. And um, let's go now to another David, David A. Hi, how you doing? Good. I was just curious, except for obesity, what are the most common health problems you address with fasting? And I was wondering if that includes hypothyroidism. And secondly, I was curious to know, when you do a water fast, ideally, should you gradually um, precede the actual fast by eating maybe one meal a day or doing a juice fast just prior to the actual water fast? Thank you. Right. So those are very good questions. Uh, the first, uh, the second one I'll answer first. It's very important that appropriate pre-feeding be done before fasting. The best pre-feeding is not to go to one meal a day or to do juices, but to eat a whole plant food SOS-free diet, particularly rich in salad, uh, steamed vegetables, and fruit. We ask people to eat exclusively raw fruit and, and cooked vegetables for two days uh, prior to fasting, at least. So that means, you know, salad, steamed vegetables, potatoes, sweet potatoes, squash, and fruit, but no concentrated foods, no processed foods, and certainly no animal foods or coffee, alcohol, uh, or the rest of it. And that makes the transition to fasting much more pleasant. Much You don't want to go through caffeine withdrawal at the same time you're trying to adapt to the fast. It's just unpleasant. And so proper uh, pre-feeding, very, very important. It also allows the bowels to be evacuated before we get uh, too far into the fast. Uh, and not leave residual materials behind that can be a problem. And then, uh, I'm sorry, what was the first uh, part of the question? The, the first part of the question, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, the first part of the question was, I was just curious to know what are the common health problems besides obesity that you address yes. with fasting and would that include hypothyroidism? Yes. And I guess the other part would be, how do you determine the number of days you should fast? Is that just based on individual medical history? Thank you. Yeah, the number of days is going to range anywhere from five to 40. That just depends on the person's history and how they respond to fasting. Fasting is diagnostic as well as therapeutic. So sometimes just how you respond to the fast gives us insight. For example, if you have um, uh, high blood pressure, you know, we want to fast until the blood pressure is normal. So, you know, depending on if your blood pressure is 220 over 120 over versus 150 over 100 may determine how long it takes to normalize uh, that effect. So, you know, fasting duration. Now, as far as conditions, it's not surprising to hear that the conditions that respond the most efficiently, the most effectively to fasting are conditions that are caused or aggravated by dietary excess. <clears throat> so obviously obesity is an issue, <clears throat> but also cardi coronary vascular disease, particularly high blood pressure, type two diabetes, autoimmune diseases, the whole host of autoimmune diseases, uh, and also lymphoma is something we've been treating a lot of. So um, these are the conditions that we treat the most. They represent probably 80% of our patient base. <clears throat> um, some conditions that have nothing to do with dietary excess are less likely to respond uh, to fasting. Uh, but what we do is we review a person's medical history in detail before, and we, uh, we do this for no cost. So we get their medical history when they complete the registration forms. We offer a no cost phone conversation with me and we go through your medical history and see, is fasting appropriate? How long a fast is probably gonna be your target? What can you do before fasting to get ready for fasting? What can your expectations be? Are you gonna respond how well? And once we've reviewed your medical history, your lab, we can usually give you a pretty good idea just based on our experience of having done this 21,000 times over the last 40 years. Um, are you a candidate? What's likely to happen? And we can also try to match you with a facility closest to you in other words, not everybody can get to True North Health Center in California, but there are other doctors we've trained around the country that are offering fast and supervision in a controlled setting. And for people that can't get to a facility, we offer remote fast and supervision, uh, as long as you have a doctor that's cooperative at your end in terms of providing you know, history exam and, and, and monitoring. We have doctors that'll work with your doctor and work with you so that you can uh, do this safely and effectively if you're an appropriate candidate for that. Mm -hmm.